And joining us right now, the Rothman Orthopedics guest line from CrossingBroad.com, as well as Crossing Broadcast. Don't miss that as well. Uh, he also hosts a little program called It's Always Soccer in Philadelphia podcast. Our friend Kevin Kincaid joins us. What's up, Kevin? Not much, man. It's great to be with you, as always, from one suburban dad to another. <laughs> <laughs> now, before I hit record... Yeah. Uh, we were swapping uh, dad yeah. stories, and uh, you have two little girls, two little angels, yeah. as I like to say. I have a yeah. uh, little little angel, yeah, and, and a little boy, uh, Leo, as well. But how's dad life treating you? Good, man. Couldn't couldn't be better. You know, what, what I would tell everybody is you got to, like, shift your mindset and uh, put yourself in a different phase of life because you're not – like, just, em, just, like, embrace it, man, you know, because it's not – they're not – it goes fast, man. I got to tell you, you know, you look up the, the next thing you know, they're like four years old or whatever. And you're like, what the hell just happened? To like <laughs> so, so it's, 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 it's hell to deal with when you're living it, but you gotta, you gotta enjoy it when you can, you know, I, I like to describe it as um, early fatherhood is the greatest joy a man can experience while having zero fun. Like <laughs> not, not, none yeah. of it's like you're planning a bachelor party. It's like, we're going to raise some kids. Yeah, no, it's, uh, yeah. It, <laughs> it's just it's like, the ultimate, it's like the ultimate test because you're like sleep deprived and like tired and aggravated but it's like hey they're never gonna be this young and uh you know and this cute ever again so i got i gotta just you know figure, figure it all out here you know I, I try to set every every time the blood starts boiling I, I like where i start getting angry or frustrated i go you'll never have this time again and then it just kind of all right. Okay. Take, take a chill. That's your like mechanism. That's your go. That's your like uh, your your namaste or whatever. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. That's yeah. my come to come to a peace moment. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know. Hey, how's this for a segue, uh, Kevin? Uh, speaking of needing peace moments, those Sixers, man. Am I right? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Uh, those. Uh, in all seriousness, I, I don't. I don't know where you're at. I've described different tiers to my audience of like tier one is, you know, uh, just don't bring back uh, uh, James Harden. And like tier five is just blow it all up and trade and beat and all that. Where are you in that kind of one to five range right there in terms of what the Sixers need to do, blow it up or just start retooling here? I mean, I don't think it's realistic that, that they would blow it up. So I, I try to think more of what I think a team is going to end up doing versus what I, what I would like to see happen. You know, I just don't see any, any path to which they trade the MVP, you know, um, mm. you know, and if you can somehow put yourself in a situation where you come back with Embiid and Maxi as a bare minimum and a new coach, um, all right, you can, you can work something off that, you know, I don't know if you're a title contender, but um, I think the thing with the James Harden situation that I keep coming back to is if, if he opts out or, you know, you don't want to offer them this extension or whatever, who, who, who is out there, Mark, that makes you, better or at least as good as you were this year. And that's, that's the thing. Like, it's like, if you want hard and gone, you want hard. That's fine. Okay. I would prefer that he doesn't come back either, but I, I'm not just going to like, you know, boot a guy out the door without a thought of like, okay, well, what's, what's the, the backside look like, you know, I mean, you could, you could, you could even talk about like the Andy Reed years. It's like, Oh, fire Andy Reed, fire Andy Reed. Okay. Well, do you have a coach, you know, somebody who you think you can go to, who's going to find as much success as he had, you know? So you got to think, through these things a little bit it's not a strong free agent class you know you got some guys who are on player options i mean who, who are your options like uh chris middleton and kyrie irving and fred van vliet on a player option i mean if you can lure nick nurse down here does 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 he opt out and come down i, I don't know it's not there's no slam dunk you know um right yeah to take here which i think it make, makes it more complicated than anything but i just i don't i don't I'm not going to do any of the trade and bead stuff, the talk or like get, jump into the trade machine or whatever, because I just don't, I just don't think that's a thing. You know, I don't think it's going to happen. I, I a thousand percent agree with you because there is nobody out there in free agency, which is why if you shift gears and you look at a guy like Daryl Morey, it's like, do you trust him to wave some kind of magic wand that gets some great return on some trade that doesn't even involve Joel and bead. That's going to put another star next to Embiid and bead and even maxi in this regard. Do you see a trade out there? Cause I don't. No, no, and I don't think there is. And, like, you know, people were giving him a lot of credit after, you know, he worked something and James Harden chipped in to take less money and and give them House and Tucker, you know, right? So, I mean, mm -hmm. we thought, all right, well, there's some wiggle room to bring some veterans in and, uh, you know, and that, that didn't get him any further than, than everything else did, you know? But um, 
I, I don't. I, yeah, again, I don't know. Like, we're, we're always talking about some big like name in every offseason. Dame know? Lillard, man. Dame Lillard, is Lillard the one? I mean, like, is, is he the, the you know? There the Bradley Beal talk a couple years ago. I mean, that, that summer where people thought LeBron might come here, right? I don't know who the slam dunk. Like, yeah, this guy's gonna get us over the hump. Person, I, mean, I don't know who that person is. You know, so it's just hard to hard to fathom that Maury can work some kind of magic here. But anyway, they're, they're still carrying the Tobias Harris contract be easier for them to get off of it hypothetically because they're in the last year now, but that's still a ton of money, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? So it's like, how do you, how do you work yourself off of that? And, um, you know, for as much magic as he pulled that first year, moving off the Horford contract and, and, and getting them to the number one seed. Like, I don't, I don't, I don't see a linear path to, to that right now. What is your confidence level then? Let's just assume for a second that it is going to be the Tyrese Maxey, Joel Embiid led 76ers going into next year, assuming that most of this stuff stays status quo. Are, are we looking at like a seven? Are we looking at a play in tournament team? Like, what do you think? Because it all, also comes down to Maxey has improved steadily. Mm -hmm. One was the huge jump when he had to take over for Ben Simmons two years ago. And then this past year, he also improved three more percentage points per game, all that jazz. So what's your, what's your confidence level in Maxey and this team? If they're the one, two punch. Anywhere from a four seed to a six seed, you know, um, uh, you know, people can say what they want to say about Harden, but he was averaging like 10 assists per, per game last year. You know, I, I think it's less, I honestly think, man, it's like less of um, the players that they have and the, the high end star power that they, that they have and more about how they, how they played in the regular season, not necessarily translating to the playoffs. I mean, look at all the fouls that they were getting in the regular season. Look at all the times we have the line, you know, and be able to, um, you know, work work his magic, rip through. You know, feel the contact. James Harden feeling contact. I mean, they shot a ton of ton of free throws, you know, and they just weren't getting those calls. And so, what's what's your your option then? Playing in the half court, you're playing pick and roll. James Harden's trying to get his mad his mismatches in his ISO. Joel B couldn't do much playing out of the post. So, you watch all these other teams that just have these perimeter guys who they have loaded with perimeter dudes who could shoot and who can defend. You know, and I just wonder if the Sixers are playing the right kind of game. If Joel Embiid is ever going to play, be able to play the right kind of game. That's just that's just a match for playoff basketball. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, you have the MVP, but if his game does not jive with what the postseason is, then um, all the talk about like my mindset, mentality, and all that stuff it might not might not matter because like stylistically, he just doesn't. He's kind of like incongruent to to what works in the modern day NBA. I, I know people talk about Giannis. I know people talk about Giannis, but he's more of a like a gazelle, like unicorn, like he can he can get up and down the floor. He can run in transition. He'll just like bulldoze people on the way to the rim. And, and Bede's not not like that, you know. So I think you can go back to the age old question of like, when's the last time a team won a won an NBA championship where the where the the center or the big was the the primary player? I mean, outside of Giannis, it's it's happened maybe like once in twenty years. Mm -hmm. You probably have to go back to like Tim Duncan. Yeah, right, right. Um, and then on top of it, <laughs> Joker's not doing so bad there with Denver and what could be happening out there. Could you imagine? We thought people are pissed off when he won back-to-back -back MVPs, Kevin. I know. I know. It's terrible. It just keeps getting worse, doesn't it? Yeah. I'm not <laughs> feeling any better the further this, dis this discussion goes. <laughs> well, I don't know if this is going to help or not, but how are the union doing? Oh, they're doing better. They're okay, doing better. thank God. Yeah, they're, doing, they're doing better. Yeah, they had, they had a little bit of a... Yeah, you know, I thought they hit a ceiling there for a little bit, but uh, I, it's fine, man. Because people were giving me so much crap because I, I tweeted something to the effect of like, you know, if Embiid Embiid doesn't have what um, what Jalen Hurts has, he doesn't have what Bryce Harper has, and he mm -hmm. doesn't have what I think I said. What did I say? I said he doesn't have what like half of the Union roster has, right? And of course, people took it the complete wrong way. I'm like, I'm not saying those guys are as good, like the MLS players are not as good as like the NBA players, but like if they just had a little bit of this, like fire, a little bit yeah. of this, like. Like desire, man. I mean, like those guys are blue collar, like grinders, hard workers. You get a Bryce Harper. Bryce Harper is a dog. Jalen Hurts is a dog. Jason Kelsey is a dog. Lane Johnson is a dog. Half the dudes who play for the Union are dogs. Joel Joel Embiid's not a dog. You know, James Harden's not a dog. You know, what everything we saw in that game five. Now I'm getting worked up here. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I, I meant to not. I, I totally meant to not put the quarter in, but now the quarter's in, baby. Well, I mean, everything that we saw in that game five, where they would, you know, they they'd have like a turnover, right, and then there'd be a chase down block on the other end, and they'd immediately like rectify the mistake that they made. And they just looked like they were dialed in, and they were showing something something to me mentally that they had not that we had not seen before. I was like, oh, this is like it, it finally happened. Like I'm looking at these guys, and these guys are dogs. You know, and they had answered every question that we had about mindset and mentality, and they ripped two two wins off in a row against Boston. They go, they went up there for the second time in the series. 
And I'm like, okay, we finally like got over the hump. This is a different Sixers team than I'm looking at. Mm-hmm. And then I just go straight in, straight into the toilet again. I'm sitting there watching game seven, and I'm just thinking like, what what <laughs> happened to this team that I just watched four, four nights, five nights ago at that point, you know? Mm-hmm. It's like a completely different team. They just, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't that they lost the game, Mark. It was how they lost. Oh, absolutely. I mean, th- th- you went from P.J. Tucker in Joel Embiid's ear – yeah. And you want to think, oh, this is exactly what you needed. You needed this kind of guy. You need this guy to rev him up and make him find more within himself. You know all that stuff. Yeah. And yeah. you found it, and then it just disappeared. It vanished. It was. But here's gone. the thing: I would, I would even stop you there, and I would say, like, why, why do you need, like, does Jalen Hurts need anybody to go up and get in his year? Mm-hmm. No, no, Harper, absolutely does not. Bryce Harper need anybody to get up in his. You know, it's like it, like the. It's funny because people always play like the. Uh, the disrespect card, right? That's like the the most baseline level motivation you can have. Like when the Georgia players, <laughs> the Georgia players come out and they win the national title, if they're clobbering TCU by like seventeen touchdowns, they say, "Well, you know, people had us going seven and five this year." Like, dude, nobody <laughs> had you going seven and five this year. So if you can talk yourself into some kind of like disrespect, then you can motivate your way that you motivate yourself that way. But the 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 highest level tier one athletes don't need any external motivation. They don't need that. They don't need you know, their coach pumping, you know, fake news into their brain. They don't need, you know, PJ Tucker getting into their ear. It's, it's innate. It, mm-hmm. It's already there. So it, it's like, I was just so disappointed to see them do what they did in that game five. And then they turn around in game seven. And I don't, I don't recognize anything about that team. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm with you there. As far as then changes for next year, uh, we, we got to look towards a new coach and that's where we're at right now with Doc Rivers being let go and Nick Nurse's name is out there and Nick Nurse is supposed to be sitting down with the 76ers and Woj put it out uh, at the time we air this, uh, put it out yesterday saying that the Milwaukee Bucks were starting to narrow their head coaching search and Nick Nurse is very much on that list. He's also on the list for the Phoenix Suns and of course he's on the list for the Philadelphia 76ers. Is Nick Nurse your number one guy and if he does go elsewhere, how much of a hit would that be to... Uh, to the future of the Sixers? Um, <laughs> my number one guy is still Jay Wright. I don't think, oh, it's, I don't, oh, I don't think it's ever going to happen, though, so I don't oh, know if that's even worth worth wow. talking talking about, you know, but he would be I, – I feel like they just need somebody who's like – I would love like a, like, a, like a Taylor Jenkins, like a young, motivated, kind of first-time NBA coach who, who like really wants to do X's and O's as, as much as, you know – focus on like the macro level motivational stuff. But Nick, Nick nurse is a good coach. You know what I mean? Everybody, everybody says like, well, he just rode Kawhi to a, a title against like the injured warriors. Okay. Well, I mean, did how many coaches have rode LeBron James, right. And did yeah, right. Mike Buddenholzer, Mike Buddenholzer had Giannis, you know? So I, you know, at what point are coaches ever going to get credit for any, for anything? You know I mean? Like that's the, the argument that we always have, but you know, I mean, in that 2019 series against the Sixers, you know, he and Brett Brown went, back and forth pretty well making like the requisite adjustments and he put you know Serge Ibaka into the starting lineup and they were going double bigs and 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 prep he, you know he pressed the right buttons in, in, in that um you know in that series and then the next year you know after Kawhi left they went to seven in the bubble with um with Boston so I mean Nick Nick Nurse hasn't been coaching I think the reason I like him more than some of the other candidates out there is because he feels less less re retreadish less like a retread i guess he's he's only coached been a head coach for like five years mm-hmm. he's 55 years old i think there's probably still some motivation in, in there for him whereas like when doc came here i remember him saying that he was gonna take a break from coaching before the sixers you know before the sixers job yeah. opened up. that was like a red flag went up a yeah lot. really yeah. Yeah. <laughs> how, much does, how much does this guy really want to coach yeah that's uh. awesome I forgot about that. Oh, man. Oh, we tore him away from the golf course, did we? Great. Um, yeah, that was like, it was, well, it was funny. It was, it was considered like failing upwards at the time, you know? Yep. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Good God. And then he didn't get, and then he didn't get them any, any further than, uh, than Brett Brown did, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. By the way, I do think Jay Wright coaches in the NBA someday. I, and I know people like, especially from the Villanova crowd. Yeah. They didn't think it would never happen. And I'm like, if you're Jay Wright and you've been to the mountaintop twice in college, don't you at least want to try the NBA? Don't you just want to see what's there at the highest level, so to speak? Mm-hmm. Well, let me ask you. I'll ask you a question. Go ahead. What do you, what do you think? If if what what do you think it would take for Jay Wright to finally take that leap? Uh, I think it would have to be a star drawing him, like oh, in a similar way to Kobe trying to get Shashevsky to coach the Lakers back in the day. Mm-hmm. It would have to be somebody of that ilk saying, "No, no, no, no. This is the job. This is the one you want." 
come here. I think proximity to Philadelphia and his family would have something to do with it as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I do think it would have to be ch- led by a star saying you, you got to come out here and, and a yeah. team that's very close to winning and needs somebody to come in with some fresh ideas. It's just funny. Cause I, like, I hate the fact that I'm, that I'm saying this, but it, it like that, that Knicks job with, with Brunson may, may be a better job than the Sixers job. If you're Jay Wright, I think so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, because I'm because I'm just like I don't I don't you know, look. He he coached you know Brunson obviously in college, and Jay is never. I mean, you know, Villanova was a very heavily perimeter oriented team. You know, four out, one in. I don't know what what Jay would do with Embiid necessarily. Not saying it wouldn't work here, but like it, it, that may just be a better fit fit for him. I don't know if it's the better job, but I think like based on his college principles and the way that he operated. I mean, going back and working with the, that superstar being one of your former players, I mean, that mm-hmm. may just – if he did take the leap, I mean, New York does make a lot of sense for him. Maybe maybe more <laughs> – I hate that I'm saying that. Maybe more than maybe more than the Sixers, you know? Well, with the Philadelphia job, it's more pressure for Jay Wright. I mean, I know everyone will say New York market more pressure, but not yeah. personally, not personally, because Jay Wright obviously won – with the, with Villanova, so everyone knows yeah. him here. Everyone expects him to be the the brainchild here. He goes to New York. He's a great college coach that's trying to turn the Knicks around. And, then, and yeah. Knicks fans will be like, "Well, all right, yeah, we'll bring on the next one. Let's go and see what no, he can that's do." That's a good point. That's a good point. I mean, because yeah, the Knicks. I mean, Knicks fans are tough. And the New York media is tough, but we, they don't know him like we know him, right? So I don't think their expectation. I don't think Knicks fans' expectation of Jay Wright coaching their team would would be the same as Sixers fans expectations of yeah. him coming, coming here. You know what I mean? Yeah. Here is a deity yeah. here. He's a deity in New York. Yeah. He's a successful college coach trying to crack into the pros. That's Plus, what it's just a st- There's just a stank of like the process stuff kind of hovering overhead. And you're always going to have these people going back and doing the revisionist history s- stuff. And like, just a lot of, uh, you felt it, man. I mean like the, the ecosystem like surrounding the Sixers ever since Hinky has just been like, just off, you know, even when they're, they're playing really well and they're doing well, it's just, there's just something that's kind of like sitting there that doesn't, I don't know how to put a finger on it, but it doesn't feel right. You know I mean, if we have damaged goods as Sixers fans, we have da- we, like this fan base has damaged goods considering if let's say you invested everything into Hinky and I like Hinky and I like the idea of breaking it down to build it up. I wasn't all for, yeah, give him 10 years to see how he can do this, you know, but I believe there should be some, you know, maybe three years of breaking it down to build it up and all that. But then it was the whole, not just the process, but then the NBA's process with the Call Angelos taking over. And then uh, Brett Brown having say final say for like 30 minutes and it costs us McCall Bridges. And then, you know, obviously you have a uh, brand come in and he had final say, and then you have Maury come in. So it's like all this stuff that we invested so much time into just got jumbled up, shaken up and tossed out to what we have now. Well, and you also have this kind of thing, too, where it was like, you know, the nature of the process was so <laughs> controversial anyway. Yeah, right. That, you know, for the people who are anti-process, like for them, the only the only way that you can justify it is with a title. Mm-hmm. You know, so imagine going into that every year and like, <laughs> you know, think, thinking that's like, because you got this huge, humongous thing hanging over your head and nobody on the team, except for Embiid, was here when it started. Nobody in the building is responsible for anything that had to do with it, you know? Mm-hmm. But that, like, kind of, like, malaise. That's what I'm saying. It's like that invisible kind of, like, it's like I'm, like, breathing in some invisible gas that I don't know is out there. But it's just, like, <laughs> this, this thing is there that says, like, hey, but, you know, like, the process. Like, there's, like, people who want who say you got to still justify this thing that may have ended seven years ago. I don't I don't know. Right. People, people always – I wrote a column about – you know, I, I think it's I think it's funny how after they lose in the second round every year, everybody has this big relitigation of the process, and they pick this like arbitrary endpoint for when they think it stopped or when they think it started. You know, it's like mm-hmm. that's just a that's a feckless exercise because it doesn't mean much now. You know, it's like if you were anti-process, of course you're going to say it's still going on today, so you can sh- continue to crap on it. You know, <laughs> and but if, but if you're a hinky disciple, you say, well, it ended when when he he left. You know, ultimately it's not. So many people. So they were, that was such a complicated, entangled mess of mistakes and errors and, and missteps that it's impossible to, to to package that nicely into some kind of thing that we can talk about in five minutes on here. You know what I mean? Oh, certainly. Certainly. Yeah. Uh, I want to get a couple more things uh, in here with you because you're a man for all seasons. Mm-hmm. Uh, Eagles linebacking core. Just want to jump to the Eagles for a second here. Mm-hmm. Uh, we were talking about it a lot on yesterday's show. Nicobe Dean looks like he's going to be your starting middle linebacker to this squad. You look around and you got a, some good edge rushers, obviously, but then your only other guy of any ilk is um, Nicholas Morrow. Yeah. We're, 
like, is this a low bar for the Eagles at linebacking core, or is this going to be setting a new high bar for them, considering the two previous guys were undrafted rookies that ended up making a nice career for themselves? Feels like a little bit going back to Howie's first year with with Gannon, or maybe that last year with Doug. You know, um, I, I, I remember I, I did this story a couple of years ago. We ranked um, the top fifty. Or we ranked every linebacker that the Eagles had um, after after the Super Bowl. So I think it was the four years after that. And I think number one was like Nigel Bradham. And then uh, <laughs> like, I, I couldn't even remember who's on there. Like Leroy Reynolds was on the list. And oh, wow. Like guys who like aren't even here anymore. But it, fe- it feels almost like it's less of the like, uh, Nico- Nicobe Dean, yeah, but again, value pick, but we don't know much about him. Yeah, you know, Morrow feels like a, a utterly average. Again, not bad, not good, not just just average, you know, tackling machine. So it's almost like they're, it's almost like they feel like they go back to their philosophy of like the most important thing is like our pass rush and we're going to be good on the back end and whatever the hell happens with the line, linebacking core, <laughs> so be it. You know, I mean, there's only going to be two of them on the field at, at all times, presumably. And, um, you know, because we, I mean, really, the Eagles' base for all these years has been has been nickel. You know, we'll see what Sean Desai is, but um, you know, we'll see if he plays more dime or takes a linebacker off or, or what he decides to do with them. But yeah, it, it does kind of feel like a throwback to the couple couple years before TJ Edwards and Kaiser White, which is like, oh, we'll just put some bodies on there and see what happens. I mean, we'll yeah. see, we'll see. I mean, mm-hmm. Kobe Dean's an un, unproven commodity, so mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. All right, now. Yeah. At the time we tape this, the Phillies are about to play their first game of a three-game series with the Arizona Diamondbacks. So watch Trey Turner go, you know, four for four with two home runs and a triple, you know? (laughs) But um, I'm going to ask this as best I can in almost a Seinfeldian way. Uh, Trey Turner, what's the deal with that guy? Why, Why do you think he's had so much struggles in his early days as a Philly? Yeah, man. Um I wish I knew. He doesn't look like a, like a shell of the um, guy that we've seen the last couple of years. But it's, it's uh, like the, you know the obvious one is like his his uh, chase rate is way up. You know he's just swinging at stuff he doesn't normally swing at. Right? I must say it's like in the forty, got up to like forty percent. It may still be there. You know, forty three percent, I believe, is what it was up to. He could just swing the garbage, you know. And like beyond that, he doesn't seem to um, doesn't seem to even recognize like pitches that are in the zone. Too, you know, it's like he doesn't have a feel for what's common. Can't really, can't really read it. And um, so, I mean, say what you will about the chase rate. I mean, he's always been an aggressive, like he's always been an aggressive hitter. Like he's trying to get on base. He's going to swing at stuff. So, I mean, you're going to swing and miss, but but um, not to the point where <laughs> where he is now. I think I think um, I think Bob um, Bob Wankel, who who works with me at CB, he had a stat that he pulled on Turner where I think he was hitting. Um, Last like three, I think it was the last four years. The last three years, he was like three forty against lefties, and um, now he's down to two, like two oh eight or something like that, which is insane. Like how did, how does that even happen? Like like falling off a cliff. My the only like plausible explanation I can think of is that he's having like a Cassianos kind of kind of year with his first year with his new team. He's just like like not. What did Cassianos say last year? He just didn't feel like comfortable. Yeah. Year he didn't feel settled here or something yeah. like that. I'm trying to give him the turn of the benefit of the doubt because I can't think of anything else that would be other than him just not not being used to it. But I mean, like, uh, and maybe there's maybe there's an added plausibility to that because they opened the the season on the road and he was like mashing those first five or six games in Texas mm-hmm. and New York. So I don't know. I don't. I don't know if that stat still. We'll see if that stat still holds. I think it was Philly's Muse who put the one up there about Trey Turner having better stats in the World <laughs> Baseball Classic. It through it's more than this Philly season, the totality of it. So. Yeah, forty-four games or whatever it was at, at that point. That was, um, yeah. Last thing for you, because I, I have to ask you this question, and I, it bothered me. And I am nowhere near the uh, person that follows the union as closely as you do. Mm-hmm. But it 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 pissed me off. I'm going to be flat out honest. It pissed me off when no one who has ever mentioned, talked about, or acknowledged the Philadelphia Union started using the union's loss of a championship in with the two other losses in Philadelphia's three. So it was like the Phillies lost the World Series, the Eagles lost the Super Bowl, and the Union lost. And And I'm like, you don't bring in the Union now just because it makes you crap on Philadelphia more. It pissed me off. Did it grind your gears as well? Yeah, but I I mean it's funny. I kind of laugh at it because it's like, oh, now they want to include them. <laughs> now now we're five for five when they lose a championship game, you know. But I mean, it, it, I don't know. It, it, I'll take any I'll take any win I can get. You know, anything that gets <laughs> publicity, anything that because at least people know they got there. You know? Right. So, right. Like, <laughs> baby steps. But it, it, yeah, it's funny, man, because they um they 
they exited the Champions League a couple weeks ago, and I was sitting there thinking to myself, again, they may they may have hit a ceiling, you know. And if they did hit a ceiling, and it's getting to MLS Cup and it's getting to the semifinals of the Champions League, that's pretty damn good ceiling, man. I mean, for a team that really does not spend a lot of money, and um, I, I like the short version of a long story for like the casuals who may be listening to this. They <laughs> they, they decided to run it back, you know, decide to run it back with the team that they had last year and. <laughs> You know, when you do that, you're kind of banking on those dudes all having the same amazing seasons that they had last year, you know? Yeah. And, like, in hindsight, okay, maybe it's naive to think they were going to score 72 goals again and only allow, like, like 26 and have, like, a historically amazing uh, goal differential. But they, they've pulled it together, and they're playing well in the league now. So maybe people people kind of jumped off a little bit, needed, like, a union break in the same way they probably need a Sixers break now. So maybe they rip off a few more wins and, you know, come back around. I'll be rooting for it. I'll be yep. rooting for it. There Ladies and gentlemen, check him out. Make sure you're following him on all social media platforms, especially right there at Crossing Broad. Read everything he's got. He's doing a phenomenal job covering everything Philadelphia sports at CrossingBroad.com and also Crossing Broadcast, which, by the way, Kevin, uh, at the time we air this later later today, I'll be on yeah. with you. I'll be, I'm looking forward to it, my friend. Right, we'll, do it. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll do it live. We'll do a twofer. <laughs> <laughs> what is it, two for an hour today? Yeah, all right. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Uh, Kevin Kincaid, Crossing Broad, does a phenomenal job. Thanks, Kevin. Appreciate you, man. And I'll talk to you soon. Sure, man. It's always a pleasure. Appreciate it. Kevin Kincaid joining us on the Rothman Orthopedics Guest Line.